Okay. Welcome everyone to ACLU's event, a conversation between ACLU past and future leadership. I am this year's president, Rajuta Nandgaukar, and I would like to tell you a little bit about the ACLU. The National American Civil Liberties Union is a nonprofit and nonpartisan organization founded 100 years ago and working in courts, leg legislatures, and communities to defend and preserve the individual rights and liberties guaranteed to every person in this country by the Constitution and the laws of the United States. It is currently the nation's largest public interest law firm. The purposes of the ACLU of Georgetown Law are to advance discussion of civil liberties on campus, to advocate respect thereof at all levels of government, and to support the local chapters of the ACLU however possible. We aim to defend and promote the protections encompassed in the Bill of Rights, as well as all other rights that protect inhabitants of this country from unnecessarily unjust or invasive government action. To that end, we sponsor speakers and debates on timely subjects and keep the campus community apprised of government actions that implicate our civil liberties. Today, we will be hearing from giants from different modern eras of the ACLU. Arye Nair was a visiting professor of human rights at Georgetown Law in 2010 and joined the staff of the ACLU back in 1963 and was executive director from 1970 to 1978. Professor David Cole has been a professor at Georgetown Law since 1990. He has been on leave serving as the ACLU National Legal Director since January 2017. And Professor Nan Hunter has been a professor at Georgetown Law since 2010 and worked at the ACLU from 1981 to 1990, first as a staff lawyer and then as the founding director of the LGBT Rights and AIDS Project. She will be moderating our conversation today. Take it away, Professor Hunter. Thank you, Rajuta. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to uh, interact with uh, students and uh, ACLU uh, groupies from, from whatever era. Uh, and so thank you very much for setting up this program. I'm certainly looking forward to hearing the discussion. And I'm sure the folks uh, who are uh, with us virtually are as well. So I'm going to start it off with just a, a fairly general question. Um, and that is, I want to ask um, Arya and David, each of them in turn, um, to share with us um, what they think of as one or two or three of uh, the most significant accomplishments um, during their time at the ACLU. Um, and also, what they th the, reflecting back, what were the most significant challenges? Um, and um, uh, and then I'm going to ask a bit, little bit more about the organization itself and how it has changed and grown and so forth. But first, I want to start with the substantive uh, areas. Um, Aria, you you actually came in during the '60s and then were. Uh, then you were executive director during most of the 1970s. When you think about the accomplishments and the challenges for the ACLU during those periods, what, what comes to mind as the most significant? Um, it's very difficult to um, uh, say which was the most significant. I think there were so many things that we accomplished uh, during that period. Um, for one thing, we helped uh, transform uh, criminal due process uh, in the United States. Um, there are still immense shortcomings in criminal due process, but we um, uh, had a role in um, excluding uh, illegally seized evidence from state court criminal proceedings. It was actually an ACLU amicus brief in Matt versus Ohio uh, on which the Supreme Court uh, made that decision. It wasn't something that the, um, the parties uh, to the, um, the case had dealt with. Um, we um, uh, participated in uh, Gideon versus Wainwright uh, in establishing the right to counsel in criminal cases. Uh, we uh, brought the cases of Escobedo and Miranda to the U.S. Supreme Court and thereby uh, knocked out a lot of the uh, coerced confessions 
uh, which had been characteristic. So that's just one area, uh, criminal due process, uh, an area where we made immense um, uh, strides during that period was in the field of, of women's rights. Um, uh, that was, I think it's, uh, that was the RBG era. That was the RBG era. Uh, I had the pleasure uh, of hiring um, RBG <laughs> and working uh, day in, day out uh, with RBG. And uh, we accomplished an immense amount uh, in uh, uh, establishing women's rights as legal rights uh, in the United States. Well, I have to ask, what was she like to work with at that point in her uh, Ruth career? Ruth was a great pleasure. Uh, she was um, a very reserved uh, person, uh, the opposite of her that husband. That didn't change. <laughs> the opposite of her husband, who was the most extroverted uh, right. person one, uh, one could think of. Um, uh, Ruth had uh, no small talk. Uh, whatsoever. Uh, but it was uh, a pleasure to deal with her. She was uh, an intellectually um, uh, diverse and significant uh, person concerned with a great range of things. I can remember, for example, when she went to China during the uh, Cultural Revolution uh, as part of an American Bar Association uh, delegation, uh, I uh, took her to lunch, which lasted for several hours while she told me what things were like uh, in China of that era, which was largely closed uh, to the world. Um, we took part in Roe v. Wade. We brought the companion case, uh, Doe v. Bolton, to the um, uh, U.S. Supreme Court and established the right uh, to abortion. It isn't as well known, but we uh, brought a case called Donaldson versus O'Connor to the U.S. Supreme Court, which was the most important uh, case dealing with the, uh, the rights of mental patients. We won cases striking down loyalty oaths. Uh, we struck down the prohibition on interracial marriage. Uh, we uh, ended movie censorship uh, in the United States. So it, it was um, uh, an era where the accomplishments were uh, just enormous. Yes, I, I mean, when I think about that, I think of those as the, uh, as, as the glory days, uh, at least glory well, days around the glory one. days, at least in the first part of my tenure, which was the height of the Warren Court era. Right. And then things uh, turned against us uh, when it became uh, essentially a Nixon court, but we won the women's rights cases and the abortion case and the mental patients' rights case uh, during the Nixon court years. And in thinking about the biggest challenges during that time, would you say that the the uh, the the ability, as it turned out, for for President Nixon to make, I think it was four appointments to the court, and really within changed, three years, yeah, um, and, and then, really just changed the direction of the court so significantly. That was um, one uh, huge challenge. I would say, in general, the criminal due process um, uh, battles that we fought in that era were great challenges. I had the uh, displeasure of being on the losing side uh, of a referendum uh, battle in New York City over civilian review of the police. And every time we dealt with uh, police abuses in one form or another, um, uh, we had um, significant public uh, opposition uh, to what we were doing. So those cases, uh, were always um, uh, matters which involved us in a great deal of controversy and a great deal of public condemnation. So, David, let me turn to you. You uh, you started at uh, the ACLU, what, at the end of 2016, the very end or the beginning of 2017? I wonder what that was like. So, um, yeah, so I started about 11 days before President Trump took office. So you know the answer to what the greatest challenge we faced was. Uh, and we faced them for the last four years. Um, in, in fact, I was, I, I was sort of recruited to um, apply for the job uh, of legal director in the spring, summer of 2016. And uh, Anthony Romero, who's the executive director today and has been for the last 20 years, recruited me with the with the, the, you know, the notion, the vision <laughs> that uh, the Supreme Court was gonna be a liberal majority court and I would get to oversee the ACLU's uh, uh, Supreme Court work and, and, and its work generally 
under the first liberal Supreme Court since R.A. Nair was <laughs> right. uh, at the ACLU in the 1960s. Right. And, and so, you know, and of course, at that time, everybody thought Hillary would win, including Trump thought Hillary would win. And uh, we would uh, we would have um, somebody else in Scalia's seat and, and we would have a very, very different world. Uh, so elections matter. Uh, the, ch- the job, I, I got hired actually before um, the election, uh, but I was still teaching at Georgetown, finishing up my teaching responsibility. So I didn't start till January. And, you know, obviously it's a very, very different job and a very, very different court in a very, very different world. Uh, but it was an incredible time. It has been an incredible time to be at the ACLU. We, we were really sort of um, one of the leading actors, civil society actors in the resistance um, to the Trump administration's abuses of civil rights and civil liberties. We, within, a, within the same week that he was elected, took out ads in the Washington Post and the New York Times that basically said, if you put in place the kind of un- unconstitutional measures that you have talked about during the uh, campaign, we'll see you in court. Uh, and uh, at the end of four years, we kept a record. And at the end of four years, we have filed over 400 legal actions uh, against the Trump administration, challenging one or another of its um, various initiatives from, you know, from the Muslim ban, mm-hmm. the, you know, the very first, his very first act as president was to ban people from uh, predominantly Muslim countries. We challenged that, got the first injunction against it that weekend. Uh, really just incredible uh, sort of start to the, to family separation, uh, to his efforts to put, um, to, to sort of uh, uh, not count undocumented uh, you know, immigrants in the census, uh, to the transgender military ban, to the uh, efforts to um, you know, basically stop Title 10 family planning clinics from providing uh, information about abortion to pregnant women who go to them for um, their health care, uh, you know, really just a remarkable set of, um, of actions. And, you know, it was, a, it was, a, it was also a time um, uh, that we, that many people looked to us as um, a place to sort of, you know, organize and, and fight back. And so our membership went from 400,000 before Trump was elected to 1.8 million. Uh, and we uh, launched the first ever grassroots uh, network of the ACLU. We call it People Power. Uh, it has at this point uh, over half a million people who have signed up as People Power activists and taken some concrete, you know, uh, action in defense of civil liberties or civil rights you know, in in the real world. Not signing a petition online, but actually, you know, going to a demonstration, visiting a member of. Their, their legislature or their city council or what have you, and reported it back to us. So it was probably way more than that, but over half a million uh, uh, citizen activists. So it's been, an, it's been a um, re- remarkable time to be at the ACLU, very different from uh, REA's time or your time. Uh, <laughs> right. Hey, can time. I comment on, on David's uh, yes, remarks? You know, um, uh, in the Nixon court era, uh, we had the Supreme Court essentially arrayed uh, against us. You know, we had uh, Chief Justice Berger, we had William Rehnquist uh, on the, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court in the Nixon uh, period. But um, we made our headway on the women's rights issues uh, during the Nixon court era. And I think we did that. that. Uh, this takes nothing away from RBG. Uh, but we did that because uh, a significant women's rights movement had uh, emerged in the country. And uh, even though the court was um, conservative during that period, um, we were able to take advantage and build on that movement and win the cases in the uh, U.S. Supreme Court. In a more recent period, uh, with a fairly conservative court, there has been a significant headway on gay rights cases. And I think it's the same phenomenon. That is, there has been a significant gay rights movement and the litigation builds uh, on the movement. And so uh, one, one can't think of the, um, uh, the developments in the US Supreme Court as if the only thing that mattered uh, was the composition of the right. court. 
Right. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more with that. Um, in fact, actually, I teach a course called Law and Social Change, and we spend a lot of time talking about those very dynamics. Um, it, but it, just sort of picking up on that, though, I mean, it, it is striking how for each of you, I mean, uh, during Arias' time, there was uh, you know, a big change in the court. Of course, some of those justices now in retrospect uh, and actually over the course of their uh, time on the court, Blackman and even Powell uh, became uh, uh, noted as if not liberals, at least um, moderates. Uh, now, David, you've got, uh, you've got a brand new court, really. I mean, there are three new justices, and which is, you know, so ch changes everything on, um, on the Supreme Court. Um, what are your, you know, what are your thoughts about, I mean, I think Arya sort of given you some advice here in, in, in essence about um, so, some of the ways to, to uh, build on, um, you know, movement um, energy. And you just talked about people power as a way that, you know, tens of thousands of people can get involved, whether they're lawyers or not. Um, how do you think about, um, you know, litigating in the Supreme Court, this Supreme Court going forward? Yeah, so, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. It's one we ask ourselves, you know, every day. It is <laughs> one that, you know, the answer to which we won't know uh, for some time. But I, you know, I do think that the, the thing I take comfort from is that really since Arie's time, the court has been a majority Republican appointed uh, conservative majority court. Um, and yet, and yet during that period of time, not only were women's rights uh, recognized in abortion, but gay rights were recognized. Uh, the, um, the death penalty was cut back uh, with respect to minors, with respect to people with intellectual disabilities uh, and the like. A, set, a whole set of, uh, of criminal defendants' rights were expanded. Um, the, 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 Somewhat narrowed as well. Some more narrowed, yeah. But but I'm just saying, you know, the, uh, the list of losses is also long. Yes. But I'm just saying, um, you know, affirmative action was upheld, uh, challenged multiple times, upheld. Uh, uh, Roe versus Wade was, uh, you know, the Reagan administration made a concerted effort to overturn Roe versus Wade, and the Supreme Court uh, upheld it, narrowed it, but upheld it. So, so far, uh, so 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 yeah, so far. But so so the point I, I think is that. Um, you know, the fact that the court is conservative is not the end of the day. You know, you don't pack up and go home, right? Mm -hmm. RA didn't pack up and go home and we won't pack up and go home. And you have no choice in some instances, but to sue and to sue in federal court. If you're challenging immigration practice, there's really no other alternative. For example, if you're in a red state with a very conservative state Supreme Court and they're passing anti-abortion laws, you have no choice but to go to federal court and to challenge those laws. And so we will and we, you know, we, we are. Um, but I do think the point about the, um, the what, what, what determines results in the Supreme Court is not you know, the lawyers and the justices, they play a part, but it is the, um, the movements um, that, that, that they find themselves a part, the court like everybody else is a part of. And so if we can move the country in a direction that is progressive on, uh, on LGBT rights, on women's rights, on, uh, on, on racial justice, on uh, criminal defendants' rights. I think, you know, history suggests that the court will come along. It may not come along with, you know, great eagerness and it won't be leading the charge, but it rarely, except for the Warren Court, has ever led the charge on social justice in this country. And even during the Warren Court, it was part of the civil rights movement, right? So um, I think you, you have to keep litigating, um, but you, you look for uh, alternative fora. You sometimes will be litigating in state courts. You look, you know, sometimes you'll be you know, going to uh, the legislatures. Sometimes you work at the local level. Uh, you know, sometimes you'll have a friendly uh, administration that's sympathetic on your issues. You need to do things to the executive. But at the end of the day, there are gonna be cases you have to bring. Uh, and what you, know, what, you what you do is you build a culture uh, culture of civil liberties and respect for civil rights and civil liberties that then makes it harder for the court to, um, to, to go the other way. 
So let me pose for you a question that I think um, uh, we have some audience interest in, and that I think it's a, a, a extremely important question at the moment, and sort of illustrates some of the uh, not the shifts in the ACLU, but maybe the inflection points or, or, or uh, uh, the ways that the ACLU has uh, approached um, some of the um, uh, uh, religion clause issues. Um, and, you know, the, so the ACLU um, has a long, long tradition of uh, supporting the rights of religious minorities and supporting the rights of free exercise and um, really uh, litigating to strengthen the establishment clause. Um, and today we have religious liberty issues coming up in a couple of very controversial contexts. One is the opposition to civil rights laws, especially for LGBT people. And the other is, and this actually in some ways surprises me the most, it's kind of breathtaking, is the way that the current Supreme Court has seemed to um, disregard um, public health expertise with regard to the current pandemic um, and, and really, uh, you know, in my view, sort of go out of its way um, to protect the interest of uh, congregations, uh, religious congregations of various faiths, uh, uh, in in um, uh, you know in the um, in their capacity to actually gather together. Um, I mean, could you, Aria, David, could you comment on that? Um, I agree with your description of this as breathtaking. Um, uh, it seems to me that the, uh, the principal characteristic uh, of the, uh, the current Supreme Court uh, is its uh, concern to define uh, the concept of religious liberty as taking precedence uh, over uh, any other public consideration, including uh, rights of others, uh, and as you say, in, including uh, uh, public health. Um, I would think that this is an area where it might be possible to mobilize public opinion um, in such a way as to uh, have an impact uh, on the court or if, uh, to, to limit in some way the Supreme Court's um, breathtaking uh, definition of religious liberty. David, what do you think? Yeah, so 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 we support religious liberty. We support we we bring free exercise uh, cases and and uh, establishment clause cases. We're concerned by the um, way that the court has, uh, has seemed to approach uh, some of the um, religion clause cases. You know, I, I I and we do we believe, and as REA implied, that the right to free exercise does not include the right to injure another person by uh, you know, discriminating against that person. And so, you know, we represented the gay couple that was denied uh, service by uh, the Masterpiece uh, Cake Shop. I, I, I argued that case for us. And, um, you know, it, it, it actually wasn't a hard case for us, even though we, we are both, we advance both LGBT rights and religious freedom because religious freedom is not absolute, just like, you know, virtually no constitutional right is absolute. And, you um, uh, and, 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 and although the court took that case, and I think many people thought that the court would in fact recognize a religious right to discriminate, it did not. Right? And I think people need to you know, keep, keep that in mind that at the end of the day, the court dodged the question in the case. It, did, it, it found that the Baker's rights were violated um, by the process, uh, a, a by, what it considered a biased process of adjudication, but it said in, in its decision, that religious objections uh, are not a basis to uh, avoid compliance with a neutral uh, non-discrimination public accommodations law. So they didn't ultimately go there. They have a case this term that we're also um, involved in, uh, Fulton versus City of Philadelphia, in which the Catholic Social Services is arguing that they have a religious free exercise right. To It's even a more extreme argument than the, than the Baker was making. They're saying, we have a free exercise right to get a government contract from the city of Philadelphia to certify families as suitable for foster care. 
while discriminating against same-sex families, even though the terms of the contract say, if you want to do this government service and get paid by the government to do it, you can't discriminate. And they're saying we have a right to government money to do the government's job for it on our terms rather than on the government's terms. If the court goes for that argument and accepts that, that broad argument, that's a, that would be very, very concerning. You know, I suspect there too, they're probably gonna end up with a relatively narrow decision, um, but, but, but we will see. And, you know, and I think, uh, you know, so, so I think this is an area to watch. I think it's an area where we have to sort of be uh, out there sp uh, speaking to the public about the uh, importance of free expression, but about the importance of restrictions on free expression, the importance of uh, when, it, when, when, they, when those rights conflict with the rights of others, um, as Ari put it. And, I do think that's a battle we can win. Uh, do you think that's a, uh, how would you assess, I mean, uh, Arya suggested, and I think this is one of the concerns of, um, for example, LGBT rights advocates, that um, religious, uh, those who invoke their religious beliefs uh, sincerely, uh, we will assume, um, are a fairly sympathetic group in terms of public opinion. Um, and that that may be a, a sort of tougher hill to climb um, than some of the some of the other issues. Um, do, is, it, does the ACLU have a uh, communication strategy uh, ready to go on this? We we do, I mean <laughs> we've been engaged in this fight. We call it religious refusals. You know we've been engaged in this battle for. Uh, for a long time now, so you know, we, in which include and when, and whenever we engage in a, you know, in a in a campaign, we we use all the tools we have, including communication. So you know, you have to tell the stories. I mean, you know, I, I think in in the um, in the cake shop case, it was the story of the baker on the one hand, but it was the story of the gay couple on the other who were you know who were turned away because of who they were, and you know, the notion that you should not be turned away because of who you are. A, a foster care family that seeks to seeks to take in a child and and, and is otherwise entirely qualified to do that, um, but is turned away simply because they are gay and for no other reason. Um, you know, I, I think if you f you focus on those who are harmed, uh, you can tell a story that is um, that it, that 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 is sympathetic. You know, these these arguments, these religious freedom arguments uh, as a justification for discrimination, are not new. Right in the in the in the uh, civil rights era, when the courts started saying you have to uh, desegregate uh, your restaurants and your schools and your swimming pools and the like, there were claims made that my religion uh, my religion requires me to segregate, and the court rejected them out of hand. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, the, the the real question I think is. You know, how, why is it that those were rejected out of hand on the ground that the right to free exercise stops at the other person's nose when you start to inflict harm on a third party? Uh, why are they not um, you know, taken as seriously today? I think it's, you know, because people are not, you know, haven't sort of fully embraced the notion of LGBT equality. And so if we can get that full embrace. I, I think that's the issue. I mean, if they came up in a racial context today, I think the result would be the same as it was during the civil rights era. Right, right. So it's so, but it, you know, so it's a, it's a fight we have to keep fighting. I, I do think, I do think that some of the folks who are on the other side have sincere religious beliefs. And I think some are using it as an opportunistic way to to sort of try to claw back some of the advances that LGBT folks have 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 uh, have gained. Well, I want us to I want us to uh, continue looking forward and looking back. But I know that one of the uh, concerns that uh, or one of the questions that some of our participants have is, well, okay, uh, you you uh, you David thought you were going to be uh, the uh, legal director during the. Uh, Clinton administration with, uh, with opportunities falling to um, uh, Hillary Clinton to appoint justices. It didn't turn out that way, but now we have a Biden administration. Um, one can't, you know, sort of 
just make assumptions based on whether someone is a Democrat or a Republican. But I'm I'm thinking, and I'm th and remembering sort of uh, Aria. There was uh, I I don't want to do, I don't want to say these are the same, but there there were at least some brief spots during your your time there when there were uh, Democrats in, in the White House as well. So how are you thinking about, you know, moving forward? What, let me, let me start, um, let me start with Aria actually, and ask you what advice you have for David uh, <laughs> as, as, as this, uh, as the political complexion has changed, at least for the moment. Well, um... Uh, I, I would say David is going to need uh, quite a lot of fortitude to uh, to deal with the uh, the court in the coming era, and it doesn't look as though Biden is going to have uh, a significant impact on the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, the oldest justice is uh, Justice Breyer, uh, who is uh, 82. Uh, if Biden gets to replace him, essentially he's pro probably going to replace him with somebody who is uh, roughly comparable to, uh, to Breyer uh, in his judicial outlook. I think we're stuck with the, uh, the Trump court uh, for a, a significant period. And so David is not going to have an easier time uh, going forward. Uh, than he has had uh, recently. In fact, uh, since uh, the, uh, the Trump court was only consolidated uh, with the appointment of Amy Coney Barrett uh, uh, very recently, um, I think David's toughest days are going to be uh, ahead of him. And it is going to be necessary to um, find alternate ways of trying to, uh, to protect rights, whether it can be done through uh, state court uh, litigation in some cases, whether it can be done uh, legislatively, whether it can be done by uh, mobilizing uh, public opinion. Um, all of those um, uh, methods are going to have to be used. And because the ACLU is a much larger organization today than it was in my day, it ought to have some uh, enhanced capacity uh, to, uh, to influence public opinion and to mobilize uh, a significant sector of the population uh, on, on behalf of rights. Um, and to some extent, I think that has happened. I think the, uh, the public reaction, for example, uh, to the separation of children at the border um, was um, uh, a noteworthy um, uh, matter. And I think inevitably it will influence litigation uh, dealing with uh, questions of that sort. I think the, uh, the public didn't respond quite that way to the ban on Muslims, but it still uh, did respond in a significant way. And I think those will, will help uh, in terms of trying to deal with the issues that are uh, coming up. I think the most difficult uh, area in the, the period ahead is going to be on voting rights uh, issues because it seems to me the, uh, the Republican Party has essentially determined on a course of suppressing as much of the vote as possible. And um, uh, the Supreme Court um, jurisprudence in recent years, if you think of Shelby County versus Holder, for example, is, is terrible uh, on voting rights issues. And I imagine that's going to be an immense challenge for David and his colleagues. So, David, I'm sure the ACLU has has a, a strategy for this for this uh, moment going forward. What what are the what are the strategic priorities of the organization right now? So, um, you know, without question, you know, there are some challenges in the, in the court. I, you know, I think it is worth keeping in mind that we um, we now have a uh, an administration that is, is likely to be much more friendly and hospitable to uh, civil rights claims in particular and, and, and to some civil liberties claims and that the experience of sort of seeing what uh, President Trump did across the board, I think, you know, has, has created the possibility for building um, a real support, a long, long lasting support for civil rights and civil liberties values. I think we saw that in the coalition that came together uh, in the election, uh, and I think we have to build and keep, have to keep that sort of coalition of folks uh, of, of folks together while encouraging 
others to uh, you know come on board and recognize the the critical importance of civil rights and civil liberties. But you know, I mean, there's there are so many challenges. I, I, absolutely, voting is voting voter suppression is a is a tremendous one. Redistricting, uh, you know, we just went we just went through the census. We don't have the numbers yet, but we will shortly. And then every state is going to have to um, redistrict. Uh, and and we are going to be involved in those redistricting battles in ways that we have never done before. We now have an, a, an analytics team at the ACLU, which has the, you know, the, the data analytics capacity to develop the maps. And uh, we've brought in, a, we've, we've hired a map expert so that we can engage in the battles in the legislatures over what a fair uh, map is and what an unfair map is. Uh, at the legislative level, and then if they come out you know, in an unfair way, then we can uh, sue uh, under the Voting Rights Act if they discriminate against minority groups and the like uh, uh, under state constitutions if they're uh, impermissibly uh, overly partisan in some, in, in some areas. So that's gonna be a central focus. Racial justice is obviously has to be a central focus. Look at what we just went through, the summer we just went through. Um, and so systemic equality is a key Sort of priority for the ACLU going forward, supporting a whole host of, of reforms, many of them legislative, not through litigation, that would um, try to bring some uh, some some you know remedy to the just deep systemic inequality uh, that this country faces. Sort of bringing privacy protections into the digital age is something we have been. Uh, we've been you know, very involved in for the last uh, 10 years and will continue to be a challenge for the next, you know, for the next generation. Uh, one of the cases we won in the last couple of years was the case Carpenter, which held that um, the, uh, the police can't search your entire cell phone simply because they arrest you with your cell phone on you. Uh, a very important sort of evolution of privacy protection to recognize the digital uh, age sort of cementing LGBT equality and particularly for trans folks um, is critical. We made a huge step forward, right? In the Bostock case from last term where the court uh, held that uh, laws that prohibit sex discrimination by definition prohibit discrimination on the basis of LGBT status. That gets us a, lo a, a long way, um, but um, there still are some serious issues with respect to um, trans rights and then criminal justice uh, you know, the, the, the age old challenge of criminal justice, but it's, you know, it's sort of remarkable on the one hand, when Aria, if you think back to Aria's time at the ACLU, they, you know, we won all these rights to protect criminal defendants, but the incarcerate, you know, the incarceration rate in the United States back in, you know, the early 1970s was, um, uh, about one seventh of what it is uh, uh, today. And it was on a par with most of our European counterparts. Since that time, it, you know, it, we, we have created the system of mass incarceration and we, we, we need to bring that back down. It has started to come down. Um, we've been- Very back, slightly. Very slightly, but it's, it turned the corner. And, you know, yes. and, and for the last 10 years, it's coming down way too slowly, but the, the trend line is down. Um, and we have to keep, fighting to, to bring that trend line down. And again, I think you know, this summer's protests and the support for this summer's protests show uh, a real concern about the way that the criminal justice system is used, uh, particularly against people of color. So you know, those are all, you know, we are a very broad based organization. And, and, then, and then let me just throw one more on the, on the uh, you know, pile and that's maintaining uh, commitment to the notion of free, free expression in an increasingly intolerant and divided world in which you know, I frankly see way too much intolerance on, from both the right and the left. Uh, and I think that's, that's a, real, you know, um, a, a real challenge. And it's one that we at the ACLU have been committed to for 101 years uh, and will you know, continue uh, to continue to fight to, to uphold. Well, that's a great segue to, um, to uh, one of the questions. Uh, that you know I'm going to ask, which is, um, I think one of the uh, events that uh, got some of the, the you know biggest public attention, um, not because of the substantive legal content necessarily during Arias' term, was the the Skokie case, which 
um, lives on as legend within the ACLU as, as a, a sort of shorthand uh, for the organization's commitment to defend expression rights of, uh, you know, of even the views that we hate and that have very little support. Um, and David, you were legal director during the, uh, the Charlottesville um, uh, situation, which was horrific. And I know the ACLU got a lot of criticism uh, from, you know, from uh, people who thought that the ACLU was not um, enough um, uh, involved in, uh, in curbing um, hate speech um, or white supremacist speech uh, and, and protecting, um, protecting others. So I don't even know which one of you to, uh, to start with. Well, uh, let me uh, start. Uh, and that is the ACLU made one adjustment uh, in its policy um, as a result of Charlottesville and it's a, an adjustment I strongly support. Uh, and that is that it would not defend as free speech um, assemblies where the participants uh, came uh, armed with weapons uh, for the, uh, the assembly. We didn't face that issue uh, at Skokie. At Skokie, uh, the uh, American neo-Nazis wanted to dress in uniform, um, and that was certainly provocative, um, but it didn't involve the, um, the threat of force uh, that would be uh, involved if they came with weapons. And I support the adjustment of not defending uh, uh, the right to assemble with weapons. David, so, did you, what, what reflections do you have on, on Charlottesville? So, you know, I mean, I think Charlottesville, I mean, obviously Charlottesville was a, was a tragedy. Um, uh, it, it was um, horrific what we saw there. Um, but but I actually think that the ACLU's role was was the right role. I mean, the, it, it, I don't think many people know the, the story, but the story was that the city of Charlottesville decided to take down the statue of Robert E. Lee, um, a, 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 um, a right wing, alt right, white supremacist group objected to that. And so they sought a permit to have a demonstration at the monument which had not yet been taken down to protest the city council's decision to take it down. The city council quite rightly gave them the permit. Then counter protesters uh, emerged who said, we wanna protest these people and we wanna protest in favor of your decision to take down the monument. And so the city council revoked the permit from the uh, people who it had previously given it to who were criticizing their decision and gave it to the people who were supporting their decision and said to the people who were criticizing their decision, you have to um, demonstrate a mile away from the, from the site that you're concerned about. Uh, clearly unconstitutional viewpoint discrimination and the, the man whose permit was denied uh, could, couldn't get representation came to us and we said, yeah, we'll represent you. We went into court and the, the, the court said to the city of Charlottesville, do you have any reason to, for doing what you did? And, you know, can you put forth some evidence that says that there's concern about violence or threats? And the city said no. And they had no defense. And the, the, so, the, so the, the permit went back to the original owners. And then, and then we, you know, we saw what happened, which is that, um, which is that the, the, they, were, they were armed, they were violent, uh, and, and the police did not keep the, the contending sides apart but let them fight, um, which, which, uh, which only escalated the, uh, the situation. Uh, and ultimately, a um, young woman was killed by one of the protesters uh, driving into her. Um, just ho horrific, but, you know, but I think it was the right thing to do, actually, um, in terms of the principles involved. And it, it, it's, it, Arie's right, we, 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 we don't defend the right of marchers to march armed. That's it's actually, we kind of revived that policy. We found actually a 1937 uh, or eight ACLU pamphlet about the rights of Nazis to march, uh, which said, but we don't think they have the right to march armed. The, you know, the marching armed reduces the likelihood that you're gonna have an exchange, increases the likelihood that this, the state is gonna have to come in and shut things down. 
doesn't advance um, uh, the exchange of ideas. But we remain committed at the ACL, we remain committed to the notion that everybody, uh, that the, the right of free speech has to be universal. It can't be something that we employ for the people we like, but we deplore for the people we deplore. It has to be a right that everybody uh, has a right to uh, engage in. And then at the end of the day, you know, if you're kind of uh, in, the, in the minority, if you are um, uh, on the outs, if you are a dissenter, if you are not, you know, in power, you should be very concerned about advancing any view other than the First Amendment allows everybody to speak equally. Because if you start saying, well, we're going to give government authorities the power to decide whose speech is you know, sufficiently civil or sufficiently uh, non-hateful or whatever to, 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 to be permitted, you know, it's, not, it's, it's going to be many government officials that you don't like. I mean, Donald Trump, would you want Donald Trump to have that power? I don't think so. So, you know, we still, uh, I, I know it's, it's less, uh, it's a view that is less and less popular on college campuses these days, but we continue to uh, adhere to the view that uh, a critical pillar of our democracy is the notion that everybody has the right to speak freely, even Nazis, even white supremacists. And if we take away their rights, uh, you know, uh, that they're going to come after Black Lives Matter and others next. And I think it's crucial that the ACLU should adhere to the position that David has articulated so well. So one thing, uh, just shift tone a little bit, this has come up in the questions from, from our um, participants. And um, I, I know that one of the ways that um, young lawyers um, get involved with the ACLU is through the affiliates. And I've always, <clears throat> I always thought, I mean, one of the things that, that struck me so much when I was there um, was the, uh, the fact that the ACLU at that point was virtually alone. And I'm not sure that this has changed all that much in terms of organizations, uh, progressive uh, reform organizations that have an on the ground presence uh, in all 50 states. Um, and so it's not just sending your dollars to a website or a national organization in Washington or New York or whatever, but there are affiliates everywhere. And so there are local people uh, everywhere who um, have the support of the ACLU behind them in standing up to some of the most outrageous kinds of power grabs and also um, are are able through those affiliates to get involved, to take cases as uh, cooperating attorneys and, and to get involved in other ways. Um, and one of the questions we've had is, is if you um, could, could just reflect a moment on what the relationship is and how it has um, uh, evolved in terms of the relationship between the national organization and this really, I think, kind of a you know unique national treasure of an affiliate network uh, throughout the United States. Um, my, first Aria, job at the, my first job at the ACLU was building that affiliate network. Uh, when I came to work for the ACLU in 1963, uh, we only had affiliates in about half the states. And um, I was involved in organizing um, state affiliates in uh, the South in states like uh, Texas and Oklahoma, as well as the, uh, the Deep South. Uh, and I didn't succeed in organizing affiliates in a number of the mountain states. That did not take place until after my tenure uh, in the ACLU. But I, I agree with you uh, that uh, the real strength of the ACLU is its presence uh, in all the states and its ability on a local level to handle a case of, let's say, library censorship or uh, the, uh, the punishment of a school teacher for um, uh, uh, teaching uh, subjects that uh, may not be of interest or, or may not that may be uh, offensive to, uh, to some members of the, uh, the local school board. Um, uh, I think that the, uh, the current administration of the ACLU has been very good about the affiliate structure. 
Um, Anthony Romero as executive director has been uh, particularly intent on raising funds uh, to strengthen the affiliates and to make sure that all of them uh, are equipped uh, to handle civil liberties matters that arise uh, in their territory. And uh, it makes the ACLU, uh, I think, the foremost rights organization uh, in the world uh, because of its capacity to, um, uh, to defend rights in every corner uh, of the United States. And I would just add two things about that. One is that, you know, that as much as we pay so much attention to the federal government, and that's what's on the front page of the New York Times, the Washington Post, and, you know, if you go to Georgetown, you're often, you know, very focused on the federal government. The reality of civil rights and civil liberties for people, for most people, is, is a result of their state and local officials. It is the state and local officials that set up the rules for voting. It is the state and local officials that are you know, policing their uh, communities. It is the state states that are regulating um, uh, abortion. Um, you know, it, it is, it, 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 so it's a, so it really, you really do need to, if you wanna be an effective or civil liberties and civil rights organization, you need to have this kind of reach. And we have incredible reach. Uh, you know, we, we have, I mean, in, in the national office, uh, I oversee about 140 lawyers in the national office. Um, I, I don't. I don't even want to ask Arya how big it was when 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 he was there. But <laughs> I, I, a lot. We're a lot bigger today. But we have another 300 lawyers around the country. And to the to the you know the law students you know who are with us today, you know I think there's no better job than being an ACLU affiliate lawyer, because you are an across the board civil liberties lawyer in the national office. Everyone. Um, specializes. We have a voting rights project. We have an LGBT rights project. We have an abortion project. And that's what you do. But if you're the, you know, in the Georgia affiliate, you're doing voting rights one day, you're doing prisoners rights the next day, you're doing a school case the next day, you're doing a protest case the next day, you're doing, you know, a race discrimination case the next day. It's, it's incredible, um, incredible opportunities um, there. Yeah, I should say that, um, we made some headway during my day. When I first came to work for the ACLU in 1963, the total national membership was about 60,000. And uh, you could count on the fingers of one hand, uh, the staff lawyers uh, around the uh, country. Uh, when I left in, in 1978, we had about 40 attorneys on the national office staff. And if you counted all of the affiliates, um, I don't think we quite reached 100, but we came quite close. Uh, but it, it's uh, clearly uh, far superior today. Yes, and when I, was, uh, when I was at the ACLU, I just had the most, um, the highest respect for people uh, in the affiliates, the lawyers and the non-lawyers who were on the ground uh, in some of those places. Uh, and it was always a pleasure for me as a, as a national project attorney to visit, um, to, to go to some of these places to litigate or speak um, and, uh, and meet uh, ACLU affiliate members around the country and, and the lawyers as well. So David, I'm very happy to hear your advice because I give that advice to George Hanson's all the time. Well, and, Look and for an of, affiliate lawyer job. Yeah, and some of our, some of our best affiliate lawyers are Georgetown grads. Well, of course, of course. <laughs> My favorite story about visiting the affiliates was that you all, I always felt I knew uh, which car in the airport garage I was going to if somebody came to meet me at the airport because it was probably going to be a Volkswagen that was at least 20 years old and probably had a McGovern sticker that was still on it. So if I spotted that in the airport garage, I knew what I was headed for. So I want to bring up a very contemporary uh, issue. And I think it's, a, it's an issue that uh, is difficult for um, a, a civil rights, civil liberties organization um, certainly, it's difficult if, if in the sort of mindset of constitutional rights in the United States, you're thinking in terms of negative liberties. But it's, it's even challenging in thinking about some of the, uh, you know, statutory um, anti-discrimination uh, issues or other issues that the ACLU is involved in. That is the issue of reparations. Um, I, and I know that... Um, uh, 
the ACLU has endorsed, uh, I believe it's HR 40, which is the leading uh, legislative proposal at the time, which calls for a study commission uh, on reparations. Um, that's, you know, that's almost, uh, to me, that sort of, you know, in terms of the idea, it sort of, you know, moves over a little bit towards some of the international law issues. I know that Ari has, has been involved with uh, since, since he not only has been a leader of the ACLU, but also of international human rights organizations. I mean, David, is, is there really a role? What's the role of the ACLU in terms of, in terms of reparations? So um, we, uh, we do support HR 40, um, which merely uh, you know, requests a commission to, to study uh, the question of reparations. Um, but we have also been very involved in sort of developing public support for the idea. We've held forums across the country. Jeff Robinson, who is the, one of my deputies, is the uh, head of the um, uh, Center for Equality within the, uh, within the ACLU, is one of the most um, uh, prominent spokespersons uh, for reparations um, and, and, and is working with uh, many members of Congress to to push that forward, you know, and I, I, I think, um, uh, you know, in, in a way there's a real precedent, which is uh, in the wake of Korematsu, um, it was the ACLU, uh, along with some uh, Japanese uh, uh, organizations, just as we are now um, working along with a number of um, black led organizations for reparations that that's worked tirelessly for 40 years, 40 years to, to get some recognition that the Korematsu decision was wrong, that the internment of Japanese uh, citizens and, and non-citizens simply because of their Japanese uh, ethnicity uh, was, uh, was wrong. Uh, and ultimately under President Ronald Reagan, uh, Congress enacted a statute which formally apologized and paid reparations to the survivors. Um, and, and that was a, it was a long fight. And this fight for reparations will be a long fight. But I think, you know, you, you, you can't go forward without looking back. And, I, and, and we, we have never really come to terms with the, uh, with the horrific uh, historic wrong that this country perpetrated on, on African-Americans in this country. And I think there, are, you know, I think we can be, you know, people often raise, well, what are the remedies gonna be? Well, I think, you know, we can get to that question once we sort of take on the enormity of what we uh, have done. And then there's all kinds of ways that you can be um, uh, uh, creative about remedies. It's not necessarily giving you know, money to a particular person who is a particular descendant of a particular person that you can trace back. I, you know, I, I think it could be about all sorts of investments uh, in the uh, in in the affected uh, communities and and all kinds of benefits that try to lift folks up today, uh, given the history of uh, keeping subordinating them for so long their community for so long uh, in the past. Uh, and uh, you you mentioned uh, that this is an issue which arises uh, in the international context, and a number of uh, countries. Um, have, um, uh, despite limited resources, uh, provided some reparations to victims of abuses. Um, the closest example, I suppose, is uh, in Canada, uh, where reparations have been paid uh, to uh, Native Americans who were um, subject to the abuses of the schools uh, in Canada, which uh, were intended to um, uh, deprive them of any uh, trace of their uh, native heritage. The, uh, the schools in the United States, in Oklahoma and Utah, um, which uh, uh, educated, uh, if that's the right term, um, uh, Native American children, including um, uh, Alaskan um, uh, Native Americans, uh, uh, were as abusive as the Canadian schools. And uh, in the United States, we have not provided the kind of 
uh, reparations that Canada uh, provided in a, um, in a comparable circumstance. Truth um, uh, commissions in various countries uh, have paid uh, reparations to uh, the victims of abuses and countries that uh, one would not imagine uh, have done this. For example, Morocco uh, has paid uh, significant reparations to uh, the victims of abuses. So it's, it's an idea that is uh, not unique to the United States. The United States uh, is, um, uh, stands out as a country that has not provided a significant acknowledgement uh, of the abuses, um, the horrendous abuses of slavery and the abuses uh, that succeeded slavery, the abuses of the redemption period, the abuses of the lynching uh, period, the abuses of the Jim Crow uh, period, and the abuses that have continued up to the present in terms of uh, police abuses and uh, mass incarceration. I think it is uh, appropriate uh, for the United States to um, consider how it could uh, provide reparations. It's going to be very difficult uh, to come up with any formula, and uh, it would be important to try to do this in a way that does not enhance uh, white resentment and exacerbate um, uh, racial tension uh, within the United States. And doing that is going to be extremely difficult. But I think the question ought to be studied, that it ought to include uh, a significant acknowledgement of the abuses that the United States engaged in. It ought to cover Native Americans uh, as well as um, African uh, Americans. Uh, and um, some formula that involves um, uh, substantial assistance to the victims of abuses ought to be considered. Right. Well, I think that's, I mean, I couldn't agree with you more with both of you. Um, as we as we sort of uh, wind down a little bit, um, I want to uh, I want to close by uh, asking each of you sort of variations on the same question, uh, which is, uh, advice for our students. Uh, and David, I, I told you I was going to do this. I have to ask you, uh, because I get asked all the time, what, what does the ACLU look for when it's hiring lawyers, especially young lawyers? And then just in general, sort of what your, you know, what your closing thoughts would be in terms of students. And Aria, since you had the first word, you'll have the last word too. Okay. Uh, and that is, uh, from your perspective, what would you say to our students? So, David? So, I guess, you know, what we look for are um, folks who are uh, committed to um, the, the rights and the values that we defend, who have shown that commitment through their um, to their work in, in, in college and in law school or between college and law school uh, and who are you know, going to be uh, powerful uh, advocates. Um, we look for diversity. We try to you know, bring a whole, bring in people from the communities that we are serving. Uh, so it's a, you know, it's, 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 it's a lot that we look for. But what I would say is that, you know, it is such a privilege, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to work uh, for causes that you believe in. Uh, not all lawyers get that privilege. Many lawyers, you know, um, uh, work for their clients, whether they believe in them or not, they are providing a service and that's, you know, that's valuable, but um, it's a tremendous privilege to actually, you know, get up and go to work every day and fight for things you believe in, not just things that you're paid to, um, uh, to defend. Uh, and, I, and I'd say, you know, that I think, you can do this work if you are committed to doing it. Do as many, get as many experiences as you can in uh, public interest or in public service, government or public interest jobs while you're in law school, in the summers, uh, externships, um, uh, experiential learning, clinical offerings. These are all, I think, critical, both to give you a sense about what you want but also so you can show your stuff to folks who are in this community. It's a relatively small community. It's bigger now than it was, you know, when I started out and, and, uh, and certainly when Ari and, and Nan started out, but it's, but it's um, still a community in which folks, you know, know each other, talk to each other, respect each other's 
opinions. And so, you know, if you go, you know, you intern at the uh, ACLU of DC, for example, and you do a fantastic job, and then you come to graduate, and there may not be a job at the ACLU of DC, but there might be a job at, you know, the Legal Defense Fund, or there might be a job at Legal Aid, or there might be a job at the ACLU of Montana. And and if you have a reference from somebody at the ACLU of DC who said, this person really did a fantastic job for me and they're, 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 they're great, that's a huge, huge um, uh, uh, way to sort of get your foot in the door. So um, I would say, don't give up, focus, do the things that you care about, keep your uh, sort of mind open to, you know, the, the path might go this way or that way, but if you wanna do public interest and public service, um, you can, and if you do it, uh, I guarantee you, you will, you know, you will feel privileged for having uh, had the opportunity to, to fight for what you believe in. Great. I couldn't agree more. Aria? Well, David said pretty much everything that, um, that I could say. Um, I, I would uh, perhaps only uh, add, and David implied this, uh, seize whatever uh, volunteer opportunities there are available to you. Uh, because once you um, uh, demonstrate uh, your willingness to, um, uh, to do things on a volunteer basis, uh, you not only have shown your commitment, but you've also acquired a little bit of expertise on a particular set of issues. And the fact that you have that um, expertise can always stand you in good stead in actually getting a, a position in the field. Um, so, so again, uh, the, the main thing I can do is repeat what David had to say. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank, thank both of you uh, so much, uh, Aria, David, for taking time uh, to, to join us uh, at Georgetown, back at Georgetown for both of you, um, and to, uh, to talk to, um, to our students who are interested in the ACLU and involved in the ACLU and perhaps others as well. I think, the, I think this is being recorded, so there may be um, maybe future viewings of it by people who are not uh, with us tonight. But I would just uh, close it off at this point. Um, Rajuta, uh, if you want to close it off, I'll hand it back to you. Uh, and if not, I will just say to everyone, um, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Hunter, Mr. Nyer, and Professor Cole for joining us today to discuss the arc of the modern ACLU and for sharing your insights as we move forward. I think we've all gained valuable food for thought in terms of the challenges and opportunities ahead, especially for us law students who are, of course, uh, perpetually on a job search. Uh, and thank you, of course, to everyone in the audience today for your attendance and incisive questions. We really appreciated your time and participation as well and hope you have a wonderful rest of your evening. Take care, thank everyone. You. Thank you. Thank you again. Good night, Sarah. Bye-bye.